programs that we can do. Sometimes it's lectures, sometimes it's workshops. Just really hands-on things that couples can do together. We also can do some uh, very fun date nights sometimes. It's not necessarily for everybody. Um, but we try to do as much as we can throughout the entire organization and just to connect as many people within the community as possible. Um, we're very, very grateful to be able to have uh, Rabbi Kiva Ruderberg, who obviously is one of the founders uh, of Emmet, and also to welcome back Rabbi Rafael Ribikov, who has spoken by, for Emmet many, many times. He does Shalom Bayer classes, and he has a shul in the five towns. And we're very, very honored to have him here. So I'm not going to give him an, an official introduction. I'm going to leave that introduction to Rabbi Ruderberg. But you guys are in for a treat, because tonight is about how to improve our marriage. And of course, we all have our own opinions, and we all have our own strengths, and things that we can work on. And Bezat Hashem, we'll be able to have a lot of tools and a lot of hands-on things that we can take from, from, uh, from this particular workshop. I just wanted to thank everybody for coming to this particular event. Look out for other emails, other text messages that, that go out. We try to do workshops like this or something like this on a regular basis. If you get an email from me or a text message, please, I beg you, don't block me. Just respond. <laughs> Say thank you so much. Um, if there is, you know, if I ever send too much, just let me know. I try not to be annoyed, but we really do want to be able to send the right amount of programs for different types of people. I was speaking to some people here, and they were telling me that their kids are now coming to the MF program. I just think that's just amazing. I get to see a cycle, and it's something that we're just very, very excited about. So, we really hope you guys enjoy tonight. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Rabbi Akiva Runenberg to have his opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Shai. Good, good to see everybody here. <clears throat> a little bit of a different direction this time. Um, but um, it's uh, a treat to have Rabbi Rubikov back. Um, I called Rabbi Rubikov the chief rabbi of Hewlett. Uh, but um, uh, Rabbi Rubikov is a person who, um, his, his reputation precedes himself. He's a, a person who for many, many literally decades has been serving the community here as a, as a teacher, an educator, a role model. And um, I still remember a long time ago, your the columns in the newspapers, and, and Shalom Bayef has always been a theme that Rabbi Rubikov and his wife, who Adina was a, a therapist, is something that they, they not only give over, but they live. Because if you give over information, and when you live that, a whole different story. So, um, before Rabbi Rubikov speaks, I just want to give a brief introduction. Uh, first of all, a big thank you to, to Shai. Um, and, um, I mentioned about all the different uh, programs going on in Emet, so I want to just tell everyone to have this in mind. There's a brochure is around that just came out, and um, <clears throat> we have really four different divisions of Emet, but the I would call it the primary beginning part of the organization is the campus division, and that's where we have programs on six different college campuses, and we have our fellowships and Shabbatons. Poland trips, Israel trips, and that's really where students get connected to Emma. And um, as, as far as I know, there's not a single person who, who doesn't have cousins, relatives, friends, who could be good candidates for the programs. So I'm just gonna ask you to think about if you have um, relatives um, or friends who have children in, in um, in, in the college years, starting from you know, 18, 19 years old. Uh, we even have some 17 year olds uh, who come to Emmet who are in, you know, about to start college or, you know, and um, they don't have to already be interested in religion. You know, this is a big confusion people have. They think, oh, I'm gonna refer people who are already interested. But what we find is that even if somebody is not particularly interested, but they're looking to be connected with friends, they wanna be more connected to the Jewish community, a lot of times that's enough to pique their interest and have them start to be introduced to the programs. And then from there, the magic starts. And the connection that they have, we just finished the semester of our program with Bet El. We moved one of our programs right here to Fresh Meadows. And um, <clears throat> it was amazing. I, I came two or three of the weeks and we did a question and answer panel. And these are many students, I would say, overwhelming majority were not Shomer Shabbat. They were very new to Judaism. The questions they asked me, I almost fell off my chair. Like, I was like, wow, it blew me away with the intellectual 
thoughtful questions that they have. And this is the approach that Emmett has. We really give personal attention to every student. So I would just ask you to think about if you have relatives, friends, um, who might be uh, candidates, and um, try to connect them connect them to, to us, or from each other, to Shai, to myself, to Sarah B, to any of, the, of your uh, <coughs> MS staff that you know, because literally our, our best students, and we have amazing, amazing students, almost always come from referrals of their cousins, their relatives, their friends. So just please keep that in mind. Um, I want to just share a brief message. We know that the month of Elul has the acronym is Ani Lidodi, Ulidodi Li. I am to my beloved, and my beloved is to me. Beautiful verse from the book, book Shir Hashir and Song of Songs. And in this verse, I think we can see something very, very powerful. Ani Dodi, I am to my beloved. I am looking to try to connect. Ula Dodi Li. And then I realize that my beloved also wants to connect to me. You know, I do quite a bit of work with relationships. And very often I find the phenomenon, maybe you've experienced this as well, where two people are each sort of waiting for the other person to make the first step. It's like, if you make the first step, then I'm here, I'm ready. But I don't, I don't want to make that step because I feel hurt, because I feel rejected, because I feel something is lacking. And I think in these words, we see this idea of make that first step. Don't be afraid to make that first, to that first step. It's very interesting this we're going to the time of Rosh Hashanah, and there's two verses in the Torah that seem almost contradictory. There's one verse where the Jewish people say to Hashem, Hashivenu Hashem Elecha Vinashuva. God, bring us close, and then we'll come close to you. And then there's a verse where, so to speak, God says to us in the prophets, Shuva Eli, but Shuva Alechem. Come close to me, and then I'll come close to you. And it almost looks like this stalemate, each side saying, you make the first step. But we know the commentaries tell us that Hashem is always making that first step to us. And if we realize that Hashem is always there for us, Hashem is always wants to connect to us, it makes it much easier for us to connect to Him. I always think about in the Shema, which is the most important prayer of the day, we accept all Malchut Shemayim, we accept our responsibilities, Right before we talk about our love for Hashem, what do we talk about? Hashem's love for us. We say, Hava Rabba, the great love, Chemla Gedolav Yaser Chamalta Aleinu. We talk about the tremendous love that Hashem has for us. Why do we talk about Hashem's love for us before we talk about our love for Hashem? And I think the reason is, is because if we can tap into how much Hashem loves us, it makes it much easier for us to show our love to Him. We start off in the morning and we say gratitude to Hashem for all the different things that we have in our life. By recognizing all those things, it makes it easier for us to recognize Hashem. And I would also say that um, we have a concept in Judaism called Shalom, peace. Where do we see the concept of Shalom, peace? So we see it on Shabbat, Shabbat Shalom. We whisper to somebody at Shabbat Shalom. And we also talk about a bayit shalom, right? Shalom bayit, a peaceful home. These two places, we find this concept of shalom, of peace. We know that the Kohen gives us a bracha of shalom, gives us a blessing of peace. Why does the Kohen give us a blessing of peace? Why doesn't, we don't find any other character trait. We don't find anything else in Judaism where we ask an intermediary, so to speak, to give us a blessing of that thing. Only when it comes to peace. And I saw a beautiful explanation because peace is inherently, the human being has a very hard time with peace. Our body and our soul are going different directions. We are in a constant state of turmoil, all different things pushing us in so many different directions. So we need the coin to give us a bracha of shalom, a blessing of peace. But why when it has these two places, why when it comes to Shabbat, when it comes to our home, our marriage, do we say specifically that there's an opportunity for shalom, for peace, that we don't have anywhere else? And I think the answer is, is because both of those places, we enter a place, or we have the ability to enter a place that goes above this world. You know, when you look at the brachot, we say to a chatan and kala, we, we keep referring to Gan Eden. 
they keep referring to the way it was before, the way it was before this physical world. And we know that a husband and wife have the ability to create this sense of shleimut, the sense of completeness, of oneness, that literally they become one. On Shabbat, we have an ability to enter this state of shalom, the state of peace. Because Shabbat is also a taste of the world to come. Shabbat, we, we let go of all the craziness that pulls us away from our connection. And on Shabbat, we're able to connect to a sense of real, true peace. So when we talk about Shalom Bayan, we talk about relationships, what we want to strive for is a sense of oneness, a sense of peace. And ultimately, that peace, I believe, has to come from within ourselves. We want to create shalom between us and our spouse. But the shleimut, the peace, I believe also has to be predicated on the peacefulness inside of ourselves, A sense of, of oneness ourselves with Hashem, with our own purpose, and then ultimately a completeness and oneness with our spouse. So, without further ado, uh, Rabbi, Rabbi Rikuta, please take it away. see some of you until Rosh Hashanah, so I want to give you all a bracha, that you should all find peace in yourself, in your marriage, and, Amen. and you should all connect to the idea of ani ludodi, ludodi li, and feel Hashem's embrace of us, and therefore it makes us want to connect with Hashem. Amen. 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 Thank you to the Bala Khatan and the Young Israel Jamaica States for housing this event over here. Of course, to the Emmet organization for all their dedication and hard work for the community. As Rabbi Rutherberg mentioned, um, we've uh, crossed paths, met with each other many, many years ago. It's always been a pleasure. We spent many more wonderful occasions together. We should give you lots of bracha, batzacha. Lots of uh, strength, lots of parnasa, to be able to continue the Emmet mission for many more years to come for the community as a whole. Again, thank you, thank you for the Emmet Couples Division for all their hard work and dedication in making this night happen. To Rabbi Ru Rutenberg, Rabbi Kraft, Rabbi Musheyev, and of course, Rabbi Shai Yunayev for inviting me to come to speak to all of you tonight. Before we begin, I usually like to give out um, some handouts. It's one per couple. I just ask, please listen to instructions, not to open the pamphlets until you're told to do so. Uh, hopefully there'll be one for each couple. We'll take it one step at a time. Try to make this a little bit more uh, interactive, not just a lecture. To get some practical ideas and tips that you might need to help strengthen your own marriages. I usually start off with something a little bit cute, a little bit fun. I used this uh, recently in a different uh, venue, so if anybody has done it before, so please excuse me, but uh, it's a good thing to try to figure out. Um, open up to the first page. Everyone has a pen? The first page is this picture over here. Okay? You have one for the husband, one for the wife. Not too complicated. This American was called multiple choice. Choose one. On the husband, which one do you like? Which one talks to you? Which one is all about you? Do you like the circle, the square, the squiggle? Or the triangle, okay? The husband should circle one of them, and the wife should circle the other one. So I circle for the husband? No, you, you, everyone, should, we're big boys and girls, everyone can do their own, unless you want to, you want to do it for your husband, that, that's, uh, that's shalom by, that, that's good. Once you've chosen, it shouldn't take too much, too long. 
choose. The husband should choose which one. Again, the square, the circle, the squiggle, or the triangle. Choose one, circle it. So the wife should choose one as well, circle it. Now, the next four pages that are there will explain to you who you are based on what you chose on the circle, the square, the squiggle, or the triangle. Now, huh? No. You can turn. You turn to the next pages and just read. Again, just get an idea and ask yourself the question: Does this, does this represent? Does this pick me out? What? Circle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll do it. Somebody has to do it. That's what I said today when I was cooking. <laughs> Does it reflect your personality? I want you to understand that when you get married to somebody, you've been married for many years, you think you know them. And the more you interact with them, you get an idea of who they are, what they believe in, what they stand for. Don't go beyond the four pages of the square, the circle, the squiggle, and the triangle, please. Western, Clint Eastwood. 
Honestly, my wife didn't like the title. Because marriage is not ugly, she said marriage is beautiful. But to understand my story of getting involved with marriage, with couples. So before I was married, I was a lawyer, working as a lawyer. I broke a sham, my wife saved me. <laughs> she found me, we decided to get married. And we took the Chatan and Kala classes at the time. And my wife tells me, this is it. This is what I want to do. I'm like, what? I want to teach Chatan and Kala classes with you. I'm like, me? It's not for me. It's your passion, your interest. I have other things to worry about, you know? I don't want to do this. But every wife knows how to get her husband to do whatever he wants. And we started at Baruch Hashem over 28 years ago, until today, Baruch Hashem, hopefully many more years to go, to continue to teach the Chatan and Kala classes. And over the years, it's branched out to table for two, giving lectures, workshops, counseling sessions, Now, honestly, I don't know if my wife had any, what's called ulterior motives, why she wanted me to get involved with this. But the idea is, the more that you're involved in the subject, the more you have to learn, the more you have to read up on, the more you have to ask questions, the more you have to go to lectures, and you have to be with the times, as I say, on the subject. And through this, our knowledge grew about married life, about parenting, and in a way it gave us a head start to understand what is necessary for us to be able to live together as husband and wife in our own marriage, and to be able to raise up the kids in the right way for them to see as an example what Sholomite is all about, what marriage is all about, what love is all about, what respect is all about, communication. Because when they grow up and when they get married themselves, what are they going to do? They're going to emulate, they're going to copy you. Because you are the example. And I tell all the couples out there, you'll do me a favor. When you have Sholem Bayit, when you get along with your spouse, and your kids see what's going on, I will get less phone calls dealing with the issues and problems down the road. And unfortunately, as we see, there's a lot of problems that are out there. So I spoke to Shai about the title and what we're going to be discussing here tonight, I said, you know what? I'm going to take 28 plus years and try to condense it. And try to go through some of the little issues and problems that I've dealt with with the couples. Again, not just the issues, and I can't cover everything because I'm, I'm very limited in time, but I'm going to pick and choose a few of the very important things that need to be dealt with, need to be understood, need to help your marriage to become better, if it is better, it become even better than that. Because it's not, it's not you. I'm not talking to anybody here specifically. It's more what's called preventative medicine. When you know what to be careful about. To drink Coca-Cola every day might taste good, but down the road, it's not healthy. If you are ahead of the game, understand what to look out for, what to be careful about, what the pitfalls are, what the issues are that couples are struggling with today, it'll give you a head start in your own marriage to watch out for the hurdles, for the potholes down the road in the journey of life that you won't get stuck and God forbid have an issue and be another statistic in the community. So go to the next page. And it says, what is the number one cause of divorce? So I'll open up the question to everyone over here. What do you think? What is the problem? What is the cause of a couple, God forbid, having a divorce? Yes. Lack of communication. Okay. Good. What else? Yes. I think in today's modern day society, finances is a big Okay. Money. Money, money, money. Yes. 
The way you fight. The way you fight. Okay, interesting. What else? Yeah. Um, other people's influence. Other people's influence. Okay, good. Yeah. Understanding. Understanding. Yeah. Lack of understanding. Lack of understanding. The media. The media. Okay. Losing hope. Okay. Good. No longer choosing each other. Okay. Good. Yeah. Lack of communication. Lack of communication. Okay. Condescending. Condescending. Okay. Big words. <laughs> A quick list I came up with. You can have issues of abuse, whether it's physical, verbal, emotional, etc. You can have issues with addictions. It could be mental health issues, it could be money that was mentioned before, communication is a problem, in-laws, all the influences, etc., etc., etc. But the answer is, the number one cause of divorce is marriage. <laughs> <laughs> the only way to get a divorce is by being married. But seriously, what is the number one or one of the bigger issues that are out there that can cause a problem. So look at the next page. The page behind this one. I don't know. Uh, so this is a, a blurb from marriage.com. Should be a site that knows about marriage, right? Updated May 27, 2022. It lists 25 common marriage problems faced by couples and their solutions. Okay. So what is the number one on the list? Infidelity. Infidelity is one of the most common marriage problems in relationships. The most recent data suggests that about 20% of interviewed men admitted to cheating on their partner compared to 10% of women. Again, it doesn't matter how much is anyone is a problem. It includes cheating and having emotional affairs. I didn't, I didn't touch her. I didn't do anything. No, we didn't. Uh, no. Other instances included infidelity are one night stands, physical infidelity, internet relationships, and long and short term affairs. Infidelity occurs in a relationship for many different reasons. It is a common problem and one that various couples are struggling to find a solution to. Again, I'm not pointing fingers at anybody, and God forbid it should never be an issue or a problem for anyone here. But we see it's all over the news. It's everywhere. And the problem is it becomes accepted. It becomes the quote-unquote norm. It's okay. What's the problem? I've dealt with couples where the grandmother says, what do you want from him? He's a man. That, that doesn't give you all right. One of the solutions are how to fix marriage problems pertaining to infidelity. Infidelity can happen when the connection in your relationship is not strong and can cause a breakdown of trust. Research reveals that maintaining a strong emotional bond, sexual intimacy, and respecting boundaries are three key ways to combat infidelity in your relationship. So what's the problem? What's the issue? I heard many years ago by Rabbi Zul Talbar, Allah Shalom. He asked the question, why is it that a woman can only get married to one man? And back in the day, we'll say that a man was allowed to get married to multiple women. As we see, Abba was married, Yaakov, Dabin so he said he wants to make a comparison as a marshal. He says a woman is like a diamond and a man is like a ring. Now, one diamond can only sit on one ring, whereas a ring can hold multiple diamonds. But at the end, the classic engagement ring is the best way to go. One diamond and one ring. One husband, one wife. That's what it's all about. Because one man is enough and one woman is enough. And also, 
By law, polygamy is not allowed. According to halakha, among Ashkenaz and even Sephardim as well, one wife is the rule, is enough. And when you start doing things out of the marriage, it breaks the exclusivity between husband and wife. If you're married to each other, it has to be, I only have eyes for you. I don't care about anybody else. I don't look at anybody else. I don't want anybody else. It's just you. I've dealt with couples who went through something like this, and I can tell you it's not an easy thing to deal with, God forbid. How people stay married is a big question. For others, it's a red line, and it's over, it's finished. It just breeds jealousy. There's a breaking in the trust. There's trauma to deal with, etc., etc., etc. When I get the questions from the ladies, for example, and again, it goes both ways. My husband wants to go away to Florida with the guys for business. I need a break. I want to relax. Rabbi, is it okay for him to go? So if I ask you the question, what would you say? Yes? No? What do you say? Again, I'll tell you, like I said, some of the stories over the years. I have a lady calling me, my husband is going to Russia on business on a regular basis, <coughs> and I think he's going for business. Until I find out he has a little girlfriend over there. What should I do? The woman happens to get her husband's phone, and he's having some texting, some pictures, rendezvous with certain women. What do you do? I have women calling me, Rabbi, I'm getting STDs, I don't know where I'm getting it from. What do you do? I have guys calling me. Rabbi, what should I do? I did something inappropriate. They took pictures. They took videos. And now they're blackmailing me for extortion that if you don't want me to show it to your wife and family, you gotta give me money. And they gave the money. Is that enough? They want more money. What should I do? All I can tell you is that these people are nasty. They're evil people. You're not going to gain anything from it. It's total desire. It's total Yitzhahara. And for what? I hate to say this. For two seconds of pleasure, you're going to ruin your name. You're going to ruin your family. You're going to ruin your marriage. You're going to ruin your reputation. You're going to ruin everything. And again, for what? It's all being selfish. Thinking about yourself. And it's no excuse to say to me, it's her fault. She made me do it. I don't care you can be married to the biggest witch in the world. It still doesn't give you a right to do something out of the marriage. You're married. You don't want to be with her, get a divorce, do whatever you want. But once you're married, that's it. You're only there for each other. Nobody holds a gun to your head. Nobody forces you to do anything. It's on your own volition. It's on your own will. Nobody to blame except yourself. The final word would be for me, don't do it. Don't even think about it. Because you will get caught. I guarantee it. It's a matter of time. And you're going to pay the price afterwards. I would recommend instead work on the marriage. Work on the problems, work on the issues. And Rabbi Kaba also said, a divorce is like an amputation. Sometimes you have to cut it off. 
but you don't do it right away. You go get help, you get a first opinion, a second opinion, a third, a fourth opinion. You do whatever you can to try to save it. You don't want to pull out the tooth. You don't want to cut it off. You don't want to get rid of it. You want to save it. Because once it's gone, it's gone. And there are options to fix it. But you have to want to work on yourself as well. So again, something to think about. Is it okay to have an emotional affair? I'm not doing anything physical, what's the problem? Can I speak to a person of the opposite sex? Can I talk to them? Can I text them? Can I visit them? Is that okay? Okay, people shake their heads, yes, no, I don't know. No. No. I don't know. Let's go to the next page. Another one of the ugly things. The negative effects of social media on relationships. What's the problem? Social media can perpetuate jealousy. Social media can set unrealistic relationship expectations. It's said that comparison is the thief of joy. You're on the internet and you're looking at a posted pictures of people on vacations all over the world. Posting, look what my husband bought for me. Look at my wife, look at my house, look at my kids, look at my watch. What does that do? I had somebody who bought a house and he's not happy. I'm like, why? He goes, Rabbi, I opened my door, I look across the street and there's a mansion. And I have a little house. I want the mansion. I'm not happy. That's a problem. Social media can decrease the quality time you spend with your loved ones. I cannot tell you how many stories, how many phone calls I get. Rabbi, is it normal thing to be on his phone till 3 o'clock in the morning? Watching movies, watching sports, who knows what else he's doing. And the same thing for the ladies. I hate to say this, the ladies are not any better. I don't know where you have time. I don't have time to breathe. Posting pictures, I went to the bathroom, I got out of the bathroom, I got dressed, I ate lunch, I ate here, I put a dish I'm, what, what, Why does everybody need to know everything that's going on in your life? Why does the government need to see your inside and everything that's going on there either? You go to shul. There was a time, Davide was Davide. But today, the ringers go off. I hate to say this, there's a break in the Davide. We're waiting for season four. What's it? You can't, it just pops out. You, you can't control yourself. You just gotta, you gotta take it out. You gotta, I don't know. Don't use a phone in shul when you dial it. Take the sidur. I also have a phone. I got the most WhatsApp to answer questions. For those that have Facebook, those that have Instagram, TikTok, and all the other sites that are there, honestly, I'm telling you, you're wasting your time. Go look at your phone, how many hours, not days, you're spending on your phone. And figure out in a day, how many hours are we awake? And this is besides having to eat, go to the bathroom, go to work, and take care of everything else. Where do you have time to spend five, six, seven, eight hours on your phone a day? How is that possible? And this is not a killer of a marriage? This is not an issue? The following signs suggest that social media could be harming your relationship. You feel disconnected from your partner. You find yourself resenting social media, phones, or technology in general. You check your partner's social media obsessively for signs of cheating or dissatisfaction with your relationship. Why are they spending so much time over there? Why don't they look at me? Why don't they talk to me? Why don't they spend time with me? The phone is more important? Everything out there is more important than the marriage, the family, the kids? You find yourself wanting to replicate couples you see online, 
And remember, everything is photoshopped, everything is fake, everything is real, and you believe it. You compare yourself and your loved ones to those you see online. You feel inadequate or insecure when you look at other relationships. Again, I can tell as a rabbi, I know couples on the outside, who was lovebirds, lovebirds. Everyone looked at them, wow, I wish I could be like them. I can tell you behind closed doors, it's rotten to the core. It's terrible because I'm behind there. It's disgusting. It's terrible. It's a I, I got to tell you. Everyone has what to deal with. Don't look at anybody else. Worry about yourself and your own family. You find yourself scrolling social media when you're meant to be spending quality time with your loved ones. Instead of reading a book, taking a little Torah, listening to a Torah lecture, reading, you know, whatever it might be, spend time with the kids. School is starting. The kids need help with the homework, something for the test, whatever it is. I'm busy right now. Don't bother. I gotta watch the movie. It's not over yet. I've been waiting for this. Go to the next page. Tips to manage social media or use the relationships. What you need to do to try to limit use social media in moderation. If you want to have it, that's fine. I'm not gonna say no. But understand the pitfalls. Again, it's very easy to be addicted to it. It's very easy to waste your time on it. Do you want your kids on it? Do you want your kids looking at what you're looking on the phone? If it's good for mommy and daddy, it's good for the kids. So be careful, don't be a hypocrite. Don't have the phone out and tell the kids, no, 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 you can't have a phone yet. You're not old enough. Everyone has it today. So you have to be the example, you have to explain to them. Set healthy boundaries, having filters, very, very important. Be realistic and share passwords. Again, my idea, some people might not agree with it. The, the spouse's husband wife should definitely know and have access to their phones, to the computers 24 7. 24 7. If the history is deleted, what is going on over there? Why is it deleted? Nothing to hide. I'm an open book, transparent. If your wife is watching, be careful. If your husband is watching, be careful. Hashem is watching all the time. Social media, marriage statistics, top picks, listen to this. Heavy social media users are two times more likely to contemplate divorce. Statistics. Social media was responsible for most of the cheating in marriage. 80% of divorce lawyers said social media was responsible for most of the cheating in marriage. And at Facebook, Cause one out of five divorce cases. Online affairs now contribute to more than a third of divorces. I, I came across the statistic, I, I want to bring it down, I, I'm, I'm embarrassed by it. There's a website where they, they pair up married people together and it, it's, it's like, it's like, it had 130 million hits. 130 million. What's going on? Okay, not the Jewish community, fine, of course not. But it's a problem. And when we're living in this type of society, it filters in. It affects us. And we have to be careful. The woman is a character by it. You have to have the guards. You have to have to make sure the walls. You have to be up by the doors. To make sure to protect nothing bad comes in. But you're walking in with your phone in and out. The worst schmutz in the world that you'll never let your kids see. Or for yourself, or for your, whatever it might be. It's there. At a touch of a button. And it's so easy to make a mistake. Or there's a pop-up or something that's going on over there, and then, uh, and before you know it, all get ahead and breaks loose. Let's go to the next page. This is called The Four Horsemen and Their Antidotes. Anybody heard of uh, Dr. John Gottman? He came up with these things, but I quote him a lot tonight. The four horsemen are behaviors that escalate conflict and damage a relationship over time. These harmful behaviors may become a normal part of communication between partners. If you have, God forbid, any of these four horsemen, you're headed down a slippery slope and you are in big trouble. Big trouble, it's just a matter of time. Number one is called criticism. Dealing with problems through harsh blaming or hurtful expressions or judgment of judgment or, or disapproval. Focus is on the perceived personal flaws rather than changeable behaviors, often met with defensiveness. For example, this kitchen is a mess, you're such a slob. 
How should you say it instead? The antidote, gentle startup, dealing with problems in a calm and gentle way. The focus is on the problem, not the person. The kitchen is a mess. Why is it necessary to call her a slob? Save the discussion for an appropriate time. Use warm body language and tone of voice and use I statements. I feel frustrated when dirty dishes are left in the sink. Could you please do the dishes tonight? Again, the same idea, the problem with the kitchen, it's a mess, the dishes, whatever it might be, it comes across very different. Again, as an example, you can say shut up, or you can say please be quiet. The same idea, but in a different tone, different type of wording, and it comes across much more softer and gentler. Number two, defensiveness. Deflecting responsibility for your own mistakes and behaviors or refusing to accept feedback. Making excuses for behavior, shifting blame to your partner. It isn't my fault, I am. You were late, not me. I guess all the time. It's not my fault. It's not my fault. She's the one who's cuckoo. She's the one who's help. She's the one who's... Help. Take responsibility. Own up to your own behavior, to your behavior without blaming others. Avoid taking feedback personally. Use feedback as an opportunity to improve. Show remorse and apologize. Again, example, I shouldn't have raised my voice. I'm sorry. Contempt. Showing anger, disgust, or hostility toward your partner. Using put-downs or insults, acting superior to your partner, and using a mocking or sarcastic tone. What should you do instead? Share fondness and admiration. Foster a healthy relationship by regularly showing each other respect and appreciation. Show affection, recognize your partner's strengths, and give compliments. Again, instead of just the put-downs, you want to raise them up. You want to make them feel good. And everyone has good things that are there. It's a matter of you looking and trying to find them and pointing them out to the person. And number four, stonewalling. Emotionally withdrawing, shutting down, or going silent during important discussions. Often a response to feeling overwhelmed, used to avoid the, the difficult discussions or problems, underlying problems go unresolved. And what should you do instead? The antidote, use self-soothing. Use relaxation techniques to calm down and stay present with your partner. Agree to pause in the conversation briefly, take a time out. Use deep breathing, you know, whatever meditation helps you to calm down and take it easy. And use progressive muscle relaxation, PMR. Again, different ways of just calming yourself down. Again, in the heat of the moment, we end up doing something wrong, saying something wrong, and then afterwards, you have to apologize for it. But at the same time, you just leave the scar, you leave the pain. By calling them this name or doing this thing, at the end of the day, it doesn't help the situation, it doesn't make things any better afterwards. Let's go to the next page. So, I mentioned number two before about using the I statements. So, we're going to have a little exercise for you guys to try to work on it. Okay? The examples are there. Read, read whatever is there. Okay, I want you to together. Okay, there's examples, the two examples that are there, and there's the three practice scenarios that are there. Okay, I want you to read the blaming, read the statement that's there, and then convert it and change it into a way where it's much more softer, much more gentler, much more easy for the other person to try to accept and to hear from you instead of saying it in a very harsh and, and degrading type of way. Okay, so take some time now. Practice on the three on the bottom. You have the scenario and then the I statement. Again, read the, the top of it tells you I feel how to do it. Again, I feel emotion word. When explanation go off that way. When you train yourself to talk in that way with the I statements, Again, not pointing at you, you're a slob, you're messy, you're terrible, you're late. Again, you're talking about the you statement. You want to now change to the I statement. I feel blah, blah, blah emotion when blah, 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 whatever it is that's being done that's making you feel that way. Okay, you take a few minutes and together come up with a statement, the I statement that's there. Again, and for yourself as well, to try to train yourself, the more you practice this, it becomes easier to understand what needs to be done on your part and you don't make the mistake of criticism and calling people by the wrong type of names.
Work together. Try to work together. next page. I appreciate a little bit more enjoyable. Maybe some of the good. Okay, there's two pages over there. Rip one out, give it to your spouse. And the other one should be for you. And number three of the four horsemen was the idea of contempt. And the antidote was to share fondness and admiration. So the I appreciate exercise, you have certain qualities that are here, I think over 60 qualities that are there, the characteristic, and you have three lines on the bottom, you want to talk about your spouse, if the husband is doing it, you write about his wife, if the wife is doing it, she's writing about her husband. From those lists that you have over there, pick one characteristic, and then write the incident that made you choose this specific word for your spouse. Okay, in other words, She's loving. How is she loving? What came to your mind that said that she's a loving person, loving individual? Or what's did something to do that made you feel loved? Okay? Again, spend a couple of minutes. Again, you have the I appreciate something more positive. Trying right, to connect with each other. And then, once you're done with the three, switch with your spouse and have them read what you wrote about them and how you characterize them.
Okay, again, everyone should have a page. Husband should have a page, wife should have a page. From the list of 60 something character traits that are there, you have three on the bottom characteristics. Write one of those words and then write an incident that came to mind why you chose this word out of the 60 something words that are there. Okay, write it out. Think. Hope it shouldn't be too hard. You have a lot of choices over there. Finish it on your own. Everyone should be working on their own. And then when you're done, switch papers with your spouse, share their information. They should know that what you appreciate about them, how much you care, how much you notice, how much you're grateful for all that they do. If you want to add more, you have the whole back page also as a blank. Share with your spouse. If you need more time, maybe we'll uh, take it home for home. Sound relationship, health, theory. 
again by Dr. John Gothman and his wife, Julie Gothman. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I want to tell you, you can look at it later and try to understand these ideas of what the house, the home needs in order to function and to have a good relationship. On the bottom right, on the bottom, we see over there what's called what about trust and commitment? What about trust and commitment? To read the word commitment, I once heard somebody said, if you had to encapsulate marriage into one word, it's the word commitment. If a person, a spouse, are committed to the marriage, that no matter what, we're going to make it work, no matter what, we're going to stay together, no matter what, we're going to get through this, it makes life that much more easier to go through everything when you know your partner is there and committed as much as you. So five ways to build trust, love, and loyalty in your relationship. Number one, make trustworthiness a main priority in your relationship. Number two, act to maximize your partner's well-being. Number three, know that trust is built in small, positive moments. Number four, avoid negative comparisons. And number five, generate frequent thoughts and acts that cherish your partner's positive qualities and minimize your focus on their negative faults. Again, this idea of building up trust in the relationship. Let's go to the next page. He says like this, after studying thousands of couples in his love lab, Dr. John Gottman discovered that almost all of the issues discussed in conflict conversations boil down to the same recurring questions about trust. Number one, will you be there for me? Will you choose me over your friends? And will you stay faithful to me? That's what trust is all about, when there's issues and problems. When the wife calls and tells me, Rabbi, my husband's tired, he comes home, he's exhausted. Okay, I send him off to bed. <laughs> all of a sudden he gets a phone call from his friend, I have a flat tire, I need you, come. Oh, all of a sudden, out the door. I don't understand. He's tired, or he's not tired. I'm not important for him. For his friends, he goes. For your friends, he does. And the same thing with the ladies, when it comes to spending with the husband or family, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, and I can't, and all of a sudden the girls call, and they're like, there's a challah party, there's a, there's a, a boat cruise, whatever it is, and they're off, they're off. What happened? Will you be there for me? Will you choose me over your friends? And will you stay faithful to me? Again, this is what we mentioned before about being faithful. Again, especially a woman. Okay, if you ask the men the question, what's wrong with looking at inappropriate pictures? I don't want her, I don't want to be with her, I'm married to you, it's all about you, what's the problem? Okay, but for the woman, when you look at these things, it's like you're having an affair. It's like you're cheating on the marriage. That's the way they look at it. And if you get these texts, and again, it goes around, these funny tags, this thing, that, whatever it is, it's funny. But if your wife is sitting right there watching it, would you laugh or would you cry? So think twice before we open up those things which are definitely inappropriate. So Dr. John Goffman, skills for building trust. The basis of building trust is really the idea of attunement. The acronym ATTUNE, A-T-T-U-N-E, stands for one, awareness. The A is awareness of your partner's emotion. Number two, turning toward the emotion. Number three, tolerance of two different viewpoints. Again, I'm a Republican, she's a Democrat. We're entitled to our opinions. That's okay. You can have a conversation. You can be stuck anyway. That's okay. That's fine. I don't hate you because of that. You're entitled to your opinion. This is America, democracy, right? Number four, trying to understand your partner. Non-defensive responses to your partner. And number six, responding with empathy. These are the skills that are needed, a tune. If you go to the next page, I'm not going to read it, it's very long, but the idea is you can look at it at home. Again, an explanation, what is awareness, what is turning toward, what is tolerance, what is understanding, what is non-defensive, and what is empathetic. These ideas are very important, again, especially in a relationship where there is a loss of trust, and you want to try to build it up again. It doesn't happen overnight, as we mentioned before, it's small increments, step by step, to get to the point of building up that trust, getting back to the way it was before the thing happened. Next page. Again, I want to stress that I'm not 
pointing fingers at anybody. I'm not saying anybody's doing anything wrong. But sometimes you don't need to make a mistake or to do something inappropriate to have problems and issues. You don't have to make a mistake of, to reach trust in your marriage. You just have to look like you're making a mistake. You're giving off vibes. You're giving off things that you're doing. Being secretive. Coming home late. Doing things where I don't know what's going on. And, I, 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 and, and again, I'm not pointing fingers. Where there's smoke, there might be a fire. But there's behaviors or things that are being done that raise a flag over there. Suspicious behavior destroys trust. To maintain trust, you have to do the right thing and be beyond suspicion. It's not enough that I'm a good boy, I don't do the other thing. But at the same time, if your wife is questioning in her mind what is going on, that's also a problem. Don't give her any excuses or don't give him any excuses to think that there's something going on behind closed doors. Is there anything you're doing that may look like it's wrong to your spouse? In this section, we'll have two columns for each spouse. We'll list suspicious behaviors and then behavior modifications. So suspicious, suspicious, suspicious behaviors, ask your spouse to list any behaviors they think are suspicious. Remind them that there's nothing to discuss here. Whatever they say is true, write it down. This is a subjective matter. In other words, if a person feels suspicious, you can't just deny it or push it away or say, eh, nothing to be worried about. That's what they feel. You have to validate the feeling and then prove to them, show to them that there's nothing to be worried about. Do not be concerned about it. I'm not doing anything that you might be thinking about. And the behavior modification. So if you're doing something that's giving off that impression that there might be something that I'm worried about, so what should you do to calm the other person down? What behavior modification do you need to think about yourself to try to... Don't worry, nothing to be worried about. I'll show you. Here's my phone, here's my computer. You want to watch me, you want to put a GPS on me, you want to have a part of the de detective watching me. You know, nothing to be worried about. I'm clean. I'm an open book, transparent. What you see is what you get. Nothing to be worried about. This part of the, of the list should be discussed. It should be a discussion. For each suspicious behavior, ask each other what are some ideas that we can agree to put us beyond suspicion. The list of agreed upon behavior modification. Again, we'll spend two minutes because we're running out of time. Again, are there any suspicious behaviors or any behavior modification that need to put, be put into place that I'm a little worried? Again, we're not accusing, we're not pointing fingers, and I'm not saying anyone's doing anything that's not appropriate. But if there's any question, you have the secretary in the office who dresses like I don't know what, I'm worried, I'm concerned. You could be the biggest rabbi in the world. Everyone has a Yitzhara. And apotropos la'arayot. Nobody can say that they're clean. And all the more so for somebody who's out there and exposed all the time, you might say, I'm desensitized, but you're not. When push comes to shove, it could be a problem, God forbid. We don't want to have situations where we're going to end up doing things because I don't know how, what, what, and what's going on. Okay, so two seconds if you want. The husband should write suspicious behavior of his wife, and the wife should write suspicious, suspicious behavior of her husband. And then, if there's any behavior modification that they need to be put into place, you can discuss it. What should I do to calm you down? What should I do that you shouldn't think that something is going on? What should I do to make sure that you know that I love you, I care about you, I will never do anything, God forbid, to cause any issues or problems between you and the family, you know, whatever it might be. The person also might have a suspicion, why? Because they have some issues from before, there was things going on in a, in a previous relationship, or other people growing up, whatever it might be, it doesn't really matter. The idea is that they have this feeling, this intuition, or bad vibes, something is going on, okay, you can share with each other, but the idea is, you know, I want to calm you down, make sure there's nothing to be worried about, okay, whatever behavior needs to be put into place, we will discuss it, and we will take it in order for you to be as calm as possible. Okay, again, two minutes again for lack of time. If you want, you can continue this at home and to discuss it on your own time.
Okay, you got, you got two pages over there. Okay, I want you guys right now to sit down with each other and come up with a date night. Make up an idea, you guys want to go out, okay? Read the instructions, go to the next page. I gave you a whole list of opportunities, different things you want to do together. You want to put in the other, whatever you want. I don't care, whatever you guys agree upon. Make yourself a date night. I know it's busy, the holidays are coming, but it's Kedai, it's worth it to invest in the marriage and to spend some time with each other. It's very easy. This is a date night, okay? It should be one-on-one. -on -one. Alone, without, uh, without, uh, without all the people out there. Spend time with each other, have fun, whatever it might be. Go back to the past where you had a good time, where you enjoyed yourself. It doesn't have to be expensive, it can be a cheap night out, a walk around the park. Go to Bogo, go to get a coffee, buy one, get one. I don't care, whatever it might be, just spend time with each other, have a date night, and do it consistently. We'll see that in a second. I can't guarantee everything is luckily okay in this list. I just copied the whole thing. But whatever is appropriate for the two of you, you know, enjoy and have a good time. Okay, the idea is for you guys to leave tonight having a date night set up. What are you going to be doing? You want to do more? That's okay. The more the better. the way you want to be treated. Take time and take time and touch. The value of human touch is amazing. Be willing to compromise, give a smile, discuss the things that bother you. Communication is key and chart your course. Okay, the next page. I don't know if everybody has the next one. Stop the plane game, everybody have that? There might be something that I'm missing. Uh, 
amazing. Thank you so much. We only have a great feedback. But then let us know what kind of programs you guys are interested in. We'll be more than happy to be able to accommodate. We, we are going to be bringing our beef, all the men who are interested, are going to be bringing right here in just a few moments, okay? Thank you so much, yeah. 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 Yeah.